Turkish electric research laboratory as a senior principal research scientist. Yeah. I was also, when I was more, same position, but I <laughs> forgot this kind of exact name. <laughs> so Jonathan actually uh, the, was uh, the, the, the in France in the uh, Ecole Normale Superior. Right. And then uh, moved to the uh, Japan, uh, University of Tokyo, and got a PhD. And then he actually moved to NTT as a poster. And uh, actually, uh, when he was in, even in the uh, University of Tokyo, uh, we actually had a lot of collaborations through the internship project and so on. So we knew each other in... 2004? Yeah, so yeah. between the 18 uh, years. And after uh, Jonathan uh, the, the, uh, moved to Mitsubishi, he actually asked me to also join. <laughs> and it was a great opportunity for me to join. And we actually had a lot of fun collaborations. And especially the Jonathan was the next brother for the uh, audio processing, uh, like a phase uh, the related uh, speech processing, uh, speech separation, audio separation, and so on. And today, uh, his talk is also about this work, and uh, I'm very looking forward to your uh, recent work. Thanks, Shinji, for a nice introduction. Very happy to be here. Finally visit CMU. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for not <laughs> coming earlier. Um, and so, it's, yeah, I'll be talking today about um, our journey at Merrill towards general and flexible audio source separation. Um, and um, uh, let's, without further ado, so first, um, of course, oh, this, does this work? No, nope. for some reason, now it works. Uh, so uh, I'll be presenting the, uh, today, but this is, uh, most of the work was done by other people than me, uh, so I just <laughs> wanted to, do, to thank uh, collaborators. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have fantastic colleagues and interns over the years. Um, so um, this is, I believe, everybody who contributed to today's topics. Uh, so I would like to thank them and acknowledge their great work. Um, so the, the, our main goal, in, I would say, in the past uh, eight to 10 years at Merrill has been to, um, to try to build a system that can perform a total deconstruction and analysis of an acoustical scene. Uh, and, and by that we mean like if you assume this kind of everyday um, life situation, um, you would, and you would have a recording of, that, um, of the sound that is in that, in that room, um, you would um, uh, analyze it and maybe figure out that there are multiple types of sounds, some of them overlapping. You may be interested in separating them. You may be interested in knowing uh, what types of sound there are, so doing sound event detection, you may be interested in uh, transcribing the speech uh, uh, or even doing, uh, uh, getting a description of, of uh, what is going on in that scene. So um, we've done uh, uh, many different uh, aspects of this, um, of this uh, goal, I, mean, I would say. And, uh, but the one I, I want to focus on today is more uh, the one related to separation and how you can, uh, from such a recording, in a very flexible way, extract a particular sound and uh, potentially use that in order to do uh, better transcription. So um, this is part of a, a bigger, um, or maybe a, a more famous uh, way to, to phrase this. Is, yes. So this, um, this notion of, of wanting to uh, deconstruct a scene um, is, is related to a, a famous problem in, in our field called uh, the cocktail party problem, which was devised, um, I mean, the, the term was coined by Cherry in the 50s. And uh, the idea was that uh, we humans have this very uncanny ability of focusing on a particular source of interest within a very complex acoustic scene. And the question was, can we reproduce this ability in machines? So if, you're, if you want to, uh, to uh, remove some uninteresting part of, of, the, um, of the scene and focus on a particular, um, a particular speaker, for example, how, how would you uh, um, enable a machine to do so? And um, so we were interested in, in that problem, and uh, there's been a lot of interest about the cocktail party problem starting, um, um, I mean, in the 50s when that problem was uh, stated, but also uh, um, a lot of work was done in the, uh, the field of uh, computational literary scene analysis, or CASA, uh, starting in the 80s, um, and a, a very common approach to, um, a, to enabling this, um, the separation of a particular audio source um, has been to use uh, time frequency mask inference. So uh, this is, um, I will explain what it is, but this goes as far back as the early 80s with Dick Lyon 
in a, in a binaural setting um, and then the PhD thesis of uh, Mitch Weintraub uh, in a monaural setting. And so the idea is that you have a, a mixture, um, a sound recording, a waveform that you analyze in some time frequency representation. So here's the uh, short time Fourier transform, but back then it would be uh, like a cochleogram or correlogram. Uh, and then you, um, you realize that in the, because uh, sound sources uh, are, tend to be sparse in the time frequency domain or in that representation, you can use masks to kind of uh, cancel the parts of the audio that you're not interested in and only keep the ones that you are actually interested in. So if you can build such masks, such masks you can apply them to the, to the representation of a mixture and then reconstruct in, in, in some way um, the masked portions to get back. So you get the masked uh, time frequency representation and then you can be back to the waveform. So um, at Merle, we started um, applying this kind of framework um, in, um, on speech enhancement first. And uh, so we started from a no noisy, noisy speech, and we wanted to get back to obtain an enhanced version uh, of that speech. And there's um, many ways uh, you can do this. You can um, phrase this as a classification problem, where you try to classify each time and frequency bin to determine whether they're dominated by, by speech or noise. And then you can obtain um, a binary mask that way um, and reconstruct the speech. Or you can obtain also um, a ratio mask. So like a, assuming that the, the energy of the speech is between nothing, zero, and the energy of the mixture, um, which is not necessarily the case, but pretty often is, you can um, try to kind of downgrade the energy of the mixture to that of the, the speech um, and then um, reconstruct that, uh, that, masked, um, speed, that masked mixture. So uh, this is a typical pipeline. Uh, if you assume that you have a mixture Y, which is a sum uh, in the waveform domain of a, some uh, target signal, some, for example, speech and some noise, uh, you would get, uh, for example, a short time Fourier transform ba based uh, time frequency representation. So you get a spectrogram. You uh, use some model, and nowadays this is done using deep networks, uh, to obtain a mask at each um, time and frequency. You multiply that mask with the original mixture spectrogram, and then you do an inverse short time Fourier transform to get an estimate of your clean speech. Um, at, at Merle, we started looking at these kind of models. And uh, we pro uh, so originally, uh, uh, other groups were also looking at this, and they were using typically um, as a loss function to train the neural network. They were using uh, mask approximation. They were trying to define an ideal mask based on the true clean speech and the, and the noisy mixture. Uh, and then they were trying to fit, the, to get the mask that is as close as possible to that I, ideal mask. And there's various ways to define that ideal mask, uh, but I won't dwell on that. Um, but um, there's a, a, a better a way that works better to do this and that we showed works much better is to do um, magnitude spectrum approximation where what you're really interested in is you don't really care what the mask is. What you would like is that once you apply the mask to the spectrum, you get something that is close to the clean speech. And um, um, one way to do this is to only focus on the magnitude and, and forget about the phase for a while. And so you, um, there's echo, um, uh, the mask applied to the um, mixture magnitude to be as close as possible to the, to the clean magnitude. But we realized that actually, um, if you're going to use the, the noisy phase or the phase of the mixture to reconstruct, you're in this situation on the top right where the mixture, uh, which is focusing on a single time frequency bin in the, in the complex domain. So this is a com these are complex numbers. So you get uh, the, the speech and the noise that sum up to the mixture. And you're, uh, because you're using the, the mixture phase, you impose that you constrain yourself to have an estimate that lies along the line that is defined by the mixture. And the best estimate, actually, the thing that is closest to the true speech in, along that line is this orthogonal projection here, uh, which um, you can get if you take into account the phase difference between the speech and the mixture. So we propose to uh, have a phase-sensitive spectrum approximation loss function that took that into account. And that, that greatly improved performance. Uh, then, actually, what you really, really want is not even that. It's, it's really uh, the reconstructed speech to be as close as possible to the clean waveform. And uh, so we also propose later on um, with, with Zhongxiu, who's uh, now here, uh, to uh, do a waveform approximation where you just basically um, train through the inverse for time for a transform. Uh, and so this is how you train the model, the last function you utilize. 
then what kind of model were we using? Well, back then we were using typically um, multiple layers of uh, uh, multiple BLSTM um, layers. And uh, so we get some, some sequence of uh, short time Fourier transform frames as input, a few uh, BLSTM layers, for example. And then at time t and frequency f, you get um, a mass value. So a single value between, typically between 0 and 1 um, that uh, tells you how much you need to, um, to decrease your, your mixture of magnitude to get a good estimate of the speech. Um, after working on this, we, uh, uh, we thought that the, the really the, what was considered back then the holy grail of the cocktail party problem was to separate a speaker among other speakers. So we, we started focusing on uh, devising a system that could separate multiple unknown speakers, so um, without any information about the speakers, using a single microphone. So if you use multiple microphones, you can use spatial information. But if you use a single microphone, you're really on your own. You have to rely on the statistics of speech. Uh, so the goal was to uh, separate the speakers. And the problem with, uh, with that we thought <laughs> uh, there was a problem with the, the original pipeline is that when you do speech enhancement, you rely on the different statistical properties of the speech versus the noise. But when you want to separate speech from speech, these properties are the same. Uh, so how do you do that? Uh, and um, so we thought that w one way to do this um, was to not train a neural network to estimate a value between 0 and 1 uh, to say how much speech varies at this bin, because there's, all of the bins are dominated by speech anyway, um, but instead to um, output some representation of the sound at, at each time and each frequency as, as a d-dimensional embedding vector. And we train the network to output vectors that are such that bins that are dominated by the same speaker or the same source tend to align with each other, and those that are dominated by different sources do not align with each other. And then if you do that, then you can use just a simple clustering such as k-means to separate the bins into two different pools. Um, the nice thing is that this does not care what the sources are. It just cares, but it doesn't care about the nature of the sources. It only cares about whether they are from the same source or not. Um, so the nice thing as well is that you can just use the same kind of system that you were using before, just replacing the output layer to be d-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. And then we propose an objective function to do this, which is um, uh, we actually propose multiple objective functions. But, but the first one was this classic deep clustering objective where basically we, um, we have our ground truth as uh, one hot label. So this on the, the, on the y axis, uh, if you will, is the, the time frequency bins uh, all align. We align all the time frequency bins, and then we have the sources on the x axis. So for each source, we, we just put a 1 or a 0, depending on, on whether it's dominating that bin or not. Uh, and then we actually don't look directly at this. We, sorry, we look, we look at the um, ideal affinity matrix that you get from that by, if you multiply that matrix by its transpose, at each, for each pair of time frequency bins, you will have a 1 if they're both on the same source, and a 0 if they're from different sources. And this doesn't depend in, on the order in which you put the sources in the Y. Um, once you have this uh, uh, ground truth information, you can build, um, uh, train a neural network to come up with uh, embedding vectors for each time frequency bin, such that when you uh, use that output to get an estimated affinity matrix, this estimated affinity matrix looks like the ideal one. The problem being that these matrices are actually massive. This uh, time frequency by time frequency could be hundreds of thousands by hundreds of thousands. You do not want to compute them. So a major, a very important trick was to not compute them and instead realize that this Frobenius norm between these two matrices, thanks to a trace trick, can be rephrased, reformulated as Frobenius norms on much smaller products. So the, it's no longer like a, a V, V transpose, but more like V transpose V. So you can actually re, uh, have a product in the other direction. So now the, the, the big di dimension is in the product and disappears. Uh, so this is, was one of the things that made uh, deep clustering possible. Uh, this is a quick demo. So we, we got to do a press release in Japan. We had the TV come. It was a lot of fun. Uh, here, I'm going to play a quick demo. Changes for the better is Mitsubishi Electric's corporate statement. Changes for the better is Mitsubishi Electric's corporate statement. Changes 
changes for the better is Mitsubishi Electric's corporate statement. And this was run on, on my laptop back then. Um, actually, you can, and this has uh, wide applicability. So this is kind of a, uh, an old demo by now and maybe dated, uh, but it's, you know, there's nothing more 2016 than uh, uh, this particular application. So uh, this, we applied it just out of the box on this recording where there's actually music in the background and did something okay. Wrong. National debt of the United States. You're wrong. There uh, you're is. Wrong. You're wrong. It's playing wrong. a really. Wrong. That is absolutely. Wrong. Proved over and over again. Wrong. We actually had. And All right. And let's see what it did. National debt of the United States. There is. It's playing a really. That is absolute. Proved over and over again. We actually had. You can get the other source if you want. But, um, uh, so, so first, you know, we um, we really actually in the, that first declustering paper, our um, straw man baseline was um, to try to train a neural network to output ma two masks, and then compare them with the ground truth and just pick the best permutation because you don't know which which speaker is going to be in which output. And then so we thought, ah, well, maybe we just pick the best and, and back propagate, but that's never going to work, right? Uh, and it, it didn't work, but apparently we had a bug uh, because later on um, we actually used that a similar uh, kind of permutation-free objective in, in the follow-up work by uh, Yusuf Izik uh, at, uh, at uh, Interspeech uh, for a, um, when we were doing a second stage enhancement on top of a deep clustering, and that, that did work. Uh, but this uh, is now known as permutation invariant training, or PIT, which is a super famous method, very successful, and uh, Dongyu was able to make it work really well. Uh, so, <laughs> too bad for us, I guess uh, it, we, we were wrong. Uh, so, um, it, it turns out that you can actually um, train a, 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 just a, a network that estimates a mass directly without estimating embeddings. And um, so, as I said, you just get two estimates and then you just pick the best permutation when you compare and back away that loss. It turns out that um, we were able to get much better performance when we combine this with deep clustering. So, uh, you could have a network that where you have your BLSTM layers and it has two heads, one that does the embedding and with a deep clustering objective function and another that kind of gets the mass directly. And that deep clustering objective actually acts as a very good regularizer uh, for, for the, the mask inference objective. And in the end, you, we get best, better performance with the mask inference head, but it gets really much better by training with, uh, with, the, with the two objectives. Then, um, uh, I, I won't be talking too much about end-to-end uh, -to -end ASR, but uh, we did at Merle a lot of work on end-to-end -end ASR led by Shinji and Taka Kihori and Nico Moritz. Um, but, so back then, like, there was a, a lot of excitation about like, uh, building a single neural network to do ASR. Uh, Shinji was doing multilingual end-to-end -end ASR, and then we were like, can we do multi-speaker end-to-end ASR uh, with a single deep neural network? So the first thing we tried was to just combine the separation network with the end-to-end -end ASR. And so you get a speech mixture, you use the, the kind of architecture I just described to get two estimates, and then um, you just basically feed both of these estimates, each of them to the ASR system, and you can train them uh, using an ASR loss. And we just pre-trained uh, each of the two part, two networks, then fine-tuned on the ASR loss and showed that we, we got pretty good performance from that. Uh, anyway, I'll just give them that. And, but later on, um, uh, Shinji wanted to go even further and, uh, and proposed to even do away with the explicit separation and just have, just do purely end-to-end -end encoder decoder pipeline for end-to-end -end ASR. Uh, the idea there is, so there's no longer an explicit separation, but just the, the mixture comes in, uh, there's a mixture encoder, then it branches out into two speaker differentiating encoder, which are tasked to make the encoding different from each other, and we kind of nudge it nudge them in this direction by using a negative um, pullback library loss to make them more diff like different from each other. And then they, they both go through um, ASR encoder with where the weights are shared, and all the other layers are, are with weights shared. And it turns out that you can train this end to end. And on the Wall Street Journal, um, mixtures of the Wall Street Journal uh, corpus, we, um, we actually got similar performance using either uh, explicit or implicit separation back then. Uh, so we were getting 14% character error rate, uh, which corresponded to about 28% word error rate. Um, this is another demo that we got to do in Japan. Um, 
And um, this time, the, we wanted to showcase this system, which was both multilingual and multi-speaker. And we thought, well, imagine you're in an airport and you want to um, go to a particular place, of, uh, a particular business, and you want to speak to ask the question in your own language without having to tell the, the system which language you're going to speak. So we built a, a, a fake um, airport guidance system uh, where you can you can speak in, in French, in Japanese, um, in uh, in English, uh, I think in German and Chinese as well later on. Uh, and it would recognize the speech and then guide you in that language to, that, uh, to the correct business. And you could have two speakers also speaking at the same time. So I'm going to show a quick demo. I need to charge my phone. I would like to go to the bookstore. Je cherche un restaurant français. To buy a necklace. <laughs> okay. Um, we then later on, um, we've work led by uh, Shankai, um, extended this to a multi-channel setting, where we had um, we had a fully backpropagable um, pipeline of kind of interpretable steps with a masking network to uh, guide a beamformer followed then by um, feature extractor and then end-to-end -end ASR pipeline. And um, later on, Shrankai then extended this to um, uh, use transformer architecture in, in various parts of the network, in the masking network, the encoder, decoder, and was able to get very impressive performance. Uh, so if you re remember, I think we had 28% word error rate on, on a similar data set. I mean, I'm not sure exa exactly the same mixtures, but a uh, very similar data set. Uh, with this particular um, architecture, um, we were able to obtain 12% uh, weather rate uh, in anechoic conditions. Um, but um, if you increase the number of channels, then you get even better. If you get reverberant, it gets much worse. But if you now use a, a standard dereverberation, you get back to very good performance. Um, all right. Um, so uh, so th before we did that work with, with Shanka, actually, um, uh, the uh, we, there was a, a tendency that everybody was kind of trying to do so se speech separation on the same uh, completely clean anechoic data set that we had put out uh, in the deep clustering paper. And, and it, our mistake, uh, the, the data set was like, it was eight kilohertz, it was uh, completely clean, full overlap. There was a lot of, of issues with it, uh, or a lot of issues with it, and, um, and, and also anechoic. And with the uh, performance was starting to saturate, that being said, back then, maybe it was saturating at like 17 or 18 dB, and now it's at 23 plus, so, so it's still not saturated, apparently. But still, like, extremely clean um, outputs. And so we thought, like, we need to go to a more realistic condition, and we proposed to, um, to build a new data set that kind of extended the previous one, but um, was, um, had a 16 kilohertz version, um, included noise that were recorded in real, in real settings. So um, we call that, we worked with a, a company called, um, a startup called Whisper AI, and they, um, they recorded a bunch of uh, sounds in, in bars and cafes in the Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area. So we called it the WSJ0 Hipster Ambient Mixtures Dataset, or WAM. Uh, and we later on extended it to reverberant conditions as well. And, and this has been uh, used quite uh, a lot since then. Um, so there's various tasks in, in that data set. So the original data set was just clean, so speech separation. There was, you could add noise in, in WAM, and then, or you could ask, add reverberation or noise and reverberation uh, in WAMR. And we found, at, uh, in the original paper on that data set, we found that cascaded approaches kind of work pretty well in this. If you first uh, denoised, 
then separated the speaker and finally used G reverberation on separately on each of the speakers. That's kind of what gave the best performance for us. And the idea being that each of the speakers is in a different location, so you should really do different re dereverberation steps for each of them. Uh, and you can do that step much better if you've already separated them. Um, so back then, uh, we got about uh, 4.7 dB at the output, starting from minus 6. Still not great, but I mean, I mean significant 10 dB improvement, but still not a super good number. Um, and later on with, uh, with Zhongzhou Wang, um, we uh, went further. We kind of doubled down on the cascade idea, um, especially improving on the speech dereverberation. And so dereverberation is, is a form of blind deconvolution. So it would be great if you knew the source or the filter. You could you know, get the other, but um, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. So um, what, how can you do with that? Um, one way to do that is to do supervised learning based dereverberation. You train a deep network to on on paired data where you have the non-reverberant speech and the reverberant speech, and you try to train the DNN to, um, to estimate the non-reverberant speech, the direct path. Um, but that, that kind of approach does not really ex explicitly leverage the, the physical aspect of reverberation, the fact that it, it's, it results from a physical process, which is the linear convolution between a dry source signal and the room impulse response. Um, there are other methods that exploit that, um, but, um, and so you can, um, that are played um, typically um, based on linear prediction. And so the, the, uh, the idea of, to improve upon this was to combine the DNN and these methods. So uh, originally, the, a very popular and successful method is called uh, DNNWPE, or, so weighted prediction error. Uh, and we proposed uh, um, an improvement on this that we called uh, uh, convolutive prediction. Once you, let's assume we have this, uh, this step that does a better dereverberation. Um, you can, a typical, like a pipeline that you could do would be you'd get your mixture, you use a first DNN to kind of separate the speech to uh, get you a first estimate, of, a first estimate of, uh, of the speech. Then you use that first estimate to get, um, uh, uh, to do dereverberation, uh, to get a, a, a better dereverberated estimate of, of the speech. And then you could combine that new estimate, derivative estimate, the, f the first estimate and the original mixture all together to a second DNN to get yet another better improved um, speech estimate. And you could iterate, actually. Once you have your better improved estimate, you could maybe do better dereverberation, et cetera. Um, so I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes just explaining the, the main difference between the WPE um, and uh, convolutive prediction. So WPE, uh, the main idea is that you want to estimate the, the, the speech from the mixture. So at time t, you, have, you only have the mixture. But you want to remove from the mixture at time t the effect of reverberation in the, in the speech signal, um, which comes from previous steps. So the way WP does this is that um, it tries to estimate a filter applied to the past steps to remove as much as possible from the current step. Um, the problem with that is that you need, you need a delay. Because if you, if you allowed yourself to use time t, you could remove everything from time t <laughs> in a trivial manner. So you, you need some delay um, in order to remo not, remove not too much. Another problem, um, so this, this is very easily done. Um, uh, first, this is done based on a, a Gaussian assumption. And it needs, in DNNWP, it needs an estimate of the clean speech magnitude, but it only uses the magnitude. And it only uses it in the, in the denominator as a weight in this least square um, objective. Um, so several issues. So as I mentioned, it needs a, a non-zero delay. It, does only, it only uses the magnitude. It cannot leverage any estimate of the phase of the speech that you may have. And also, because you're removing um, past samples of the mixture, which includes noise, um, then you're kind of, what you're removing also includes noise. So you, if the noise is very prominent, you could actually be estimating the reverberation of the noise, almost. Um, so it's not clear that this is not very robust to noise and interferences. On the, on the other hand, what we do is very similar yet different. Uh, at time t, we are trying to remove from the, we assume we have a mixture and a first estimate of um, the speech. So by the way, everything I'm talking about here is in, a, is a one, in one frequency, in the time frequency uh, domain. Uh, so we're trying to um, find a filter at, at a particular frequency at time t um, to remove 
um, that we apply to the estimate of the clean speech, which is what actually reverberation is. It's a filter applied to the clean speech. And, uh, and then to remove that, uh, it's very annoying that my mouse keeps disappearing, um, uh, from the mixture. So the equation here is now our estimate of a speech is inside the numerator instead of being in the denominator. Um, we don't need a delay. Uh, we use both the um, phase and the magnitude estimate. So this is a, a complex value here. Uh, and also we, are, we can show that we're more robust to noise and interferences. Um, in, so we train a network to do um, this task of noisy river speech separation. We also explore different loss functions that are uh, more involved. So junctures models typically uh, estimate both the real and imaginary components in the time frequency complex domain. Uh, so you can have, you can just have your loss function on these components. Um, but um, we found out that adding another loss function on the magnitude itself um, kind of decreases a little bit the performance on SNR type of metrics, but improves greatly uh, on like, other metrics such as speech quality, intelligibility, and also ASR performance. So here is the result. So um, if you remember, we were at 4.7 dB, I believe, um, in the original Weimar paper. And uh, using uh, this cumulative prediction in, in between two DNNs and also iterating, doing two passes of a, of a second part, um, Juncture was able to get to 7.5 dB. All right, uh, so, so far uh, we've looked at a lot of supervised um, methods, but we're, we're also interested in how can we train um, models that do not rely on supervised data. So, um, arguably, humans probably were not trained by comparing reverberant and non-reverberant <laughs> paired data, for example, or, or like um, speech mixture versus uh, isolated speech. So we're in, it's, uh, as a science question, how can we uh, make a system that kind of learns to do that uh, without supervised data? So the first work we did on that, on that, in that direction uh, was um, instead of assuming that we have paired data, we assume that we have two channels, which in the case of human, we, we do. Um, so let's assume you have two ears. And you're going to use in a very crude um, spatial source separation algorithm that leverages the spatial information to, get, to give you a first pseudo ground truth of, um, of a separated speech. And that's not going to always work, because if the sources are very close to each other, your crude spatial separation algorithm is going to fail. So you should not blindly use this blind spatial separation algorithm. Um, it's be you, we wanted to select samples that are better, that lead to better pseudo ground truth. Uh, for example, in, in situations where the sources are very far apart. So we, what we propose is like um, to, we try to derive a, a confidence measure for each mixture that you get um, based on, um, on the quality of the, of the clustering of the time frequency bins. Uh, for example, if, like, if the clustering, uh, if the, on the spatial features, if you ended up with with features that all clustered in the same point, it probably meant that you'd, you would fail at separating the two sources, for example. And also, we used the, the confidence of um, like the posterior probability for at each time frequency bin of the assignment to a cluster as a way to say whether the, this um, crude spatial separation system thinks it's confident about what it output. Um, and, and by doing so, we were able to kind of select um, um, in, a, in, a, in a smooth way. It was not like ever take or ditch, it was really for each time frequency bin in each mixture, we put a weight on it, on the information that it would then give a deep clustering um, system to, to, um, to train a deep clustering system to separate single channel mixtures. So we use a training time, we have two channels, but at test time, we only have one channel. Um, and this shows that the, this confidence measure kind of correlates well with, um, sort of well, with the SDR of the output of that spatial clustering of a spatial separation. Um, and it turns out that like, you, you can kind of, the, the confidence helps. These, these weights that I mentioned uh, help. You get like 1 dB better by using these, these weights. Um, it's, by using the weights, it's kind of a trade-off between the quantity of data that you have and the quality. So if, uh, if, uh, if you really rely on the confidence measure, you're only going to use the very confident point but of which there's less of. Um, and, and we found that in, also in two channels, um, Sometimes the original blind separation is better. Sometimes the single channel separation is better. So if you combine both, you can get a bit, uh, some improvement. 
then more recently, actually, uh, I think this was out last month, um, we tried a, another take on the similar setting. And again, we assume that we have two channel mixtures at training time. Uh, but he, now we do this, we, we did things a bit differently. So you assume that uh, you're, uh, you have two sources and uh, you have so two mixtures at the left and the right channel. And you feed only the left channel to a speech separation model. And the goal of the speech separation model is to separate the sources um, such that you could predict the right channel from the separated sources. So you could add them together, but that's not going to work um, because you don't know where the sources are. So there's no way for the speech separation model to output um, sources that have the correct channel, the correct room impulse response of the right channel, because that depends on where the sources are. Like what you heard at the left channel is, is going to be different than what you heard at the right channel. They're going to be shifted, they're going to be different uh, scales. So you can do that. Um, instead, what we propose to do is to apply a Wiener filter to each source, each output of the network, um, against the right channel mixture. So at training time, we assume we know the right channel mixture. So we kind of fit, we fit the, uh, each output to the mixture to kind of color it in how it should be in the right channel. We apply that filter. And after applying that filter, we get an estimate. We get a predicted right channel. And our loss function is the difference between that predicted right channel, um, where we use some oracle knowledge about the, the, right, the right channel, um, and, uh, and the actual right channel. And we show that, and this is an oracle experiment, um, where we compare how well you can fit the right channel based on various signals. So if you, if you use as your um, estimate of the speakers just the, the left channel mixture, so very bad estimate of the mixture, uh, of the sources, uh, you can, by using Wiener filter to match that to the right channel mixture um, for both sources separately, then adding that, you only get 7 dB reconstruction. If you use the um, true reverberant um, source image signals at the left channel, which is what you really, you hope that maybe your system is going to get, and then apply Wiener filter and reconstruct, you get 12 dB. If you use the dry one, you get 13. So this, can, this hints at the fact that this loss function, because it wants to in, increase the SDR, um, if, it, if the network can give you a uh, can separate resources, it will do better at that loss function. If it can also dereverberate a little bit, it will do even better. So there's hope. Now, that being said, um, this is not, um, we realized um, halfway through that the Wiener filter does not really constrain the network to output independent estimates. It can still play tricks. It can like re reconfigure, um, if, an, if the network did not fully separate resources, it can still re, like, reassign correctly um, the, um, the missed, um, uh, the, the misseparated um, portions and get still a quite good reconstruction. So, it, so this doesn't work in a fully unsupervised setting. We have to guide it a little bit. Um, so we, we show, though, that if you use a, a semi-supervised setting where you assume you have just a few supervised data, where you have the mixture and the corresponding sources, Let's say you have, um, out of 20,000 mixtures, you have 1,000 where you have uh, the corresponding isolated sources. If you train a supervised model on only the 1,000, you get uh, 3.5 dB SISDR uh, on the, against the, the true reverberant um, sources. If you add the 19,000 unsupervised mixtures and you use our loss function, you can get to 5.7 dB. Uh, whereas if you train on the whole t on the, all the 20,000, you get 6.6 .6 dB. So we, we're able to, um, uh, and this starts at, at zero, so the, the supervised model kind of recover on supervised model, only 1,000 sample gets 45% of the way of the top line, and we get 78% of the way. So this is still, I feel like there's still much more that can be done in this work. I'd like to make it fully unsupervised, but yeah, still uh, next, next time. <laughs> um, all right. How am I doing on time? I think I can't remember what time we started. So, um, um, so let me maybe move now to more uh, non-speech sounds. Um, 
And the difficulty in, in non-speech sounds uh, is that it's, e it's even harder to, to uh, generate realistic mixtures. Um, so we, we, um, we, the first work we did, like we wanted to um, reduce the amount of supervision you have to give uh, the, uh, the system in order to train it. So you see that this has been a, 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 a broad theme uh, uh, at Merle, but in this particular case, we wanted to know if you could train a separation system without using strong labels, which in this case for us means the isolated sources, but like the time frequency, or I mean the actual waveforms of the, or the time frequency representations of the, of the sources, but only using weak information, such as either whether a source is present or not in a clip, a 10 second clip, or maybe a slightly less weak, but still weak in our, in our book, uh, from when to when the, they were active. And it turns out you can, you can kind of do that okay. Um, and the, the thing is, how do you link, how do you build a loss function that, that bridges the, um, the estimated sources and these labels? And you can use actually a classifier to do that. So you can train a, a sound event detector or, or an audio tagger on the mixtures uh, to get these tags, because you have, you have mixtures and you have, t you have um, these uh, labels. And once you have trained your classifier, you, fi you, you just uh, fix it and you then train the separator such that uh, each of the sources, after they go through the classifier, uh, the separate sources do have the correct labels. Um, I'm gonna skip the examples uh, in the interest of time. We, went, we wanted to go um, uh, see if we could do a bit better if, um, if we could introduce some amount of information about the frequency, um, but not the actual signal. So um, in that in that case, music is kind of a nice uh, medium because um, you can have the score, which gives you both time and some amount of information on the frequency, on, on, on the fundamental frequency, but not the whole thing. You don't have the whole spectrum. Um, so we, we tried to train a music separation system based on score only. Um, and by score here, I actually mean to make our life easier. We assume we had an alignment and we actually had the MIDI uh, that generated the audio. Uh, and very similar system, um, instead of using a classifier, we use a transcriptor, uh, which try to transcribe for each uh, time and pitch and each instrument, uh, if there's an activity or not. Uh, we also considered um, adversarial loss functions, which I think are kind of cute. Um, in, in one of them, we, um, we try to, um, uh, we try to recover the score, like let's say in the piano output, we try to use the piano output to um, recover the guitar score. And, and if you can do that, it's bad. So we try to this kind of decrease. Uh, the, the more you can recover the guitar score from a piano, the, 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 the worse it is. Uh, and we had yet another adversarial um, fine tuning where we separated multiple mixtures, music pieces, and then took one output of each, mixed them together so that it looks like a synthetic mixture, and then try to um, to make the transcriptor fail on that mixture. Um, I'm gonna skip the, uh, the uh, experiments. Another direction uh, we explored is that of hierarchical source separation. Um, this stems from the, the, the fact that source separation problem is kind of inherently ill-posed, like what is a source? Uh, it, it, there, there may be multiple definitions of a source depending on what you're interested in uh, and, and the situation. For example, let's say you're listening to um, um, people, like people having a, a, having a conversation, like multiple conversations while the radio is playing. Um, I, do you want to separate, and the radio is playing some, some band, um, like music by a band. Do you, do you want to separate the band as a whole or do you want to separate each of the sources? Do you want to separate each conversation or each speaker or just the whole? Uh, so, I mean, there's kind of a hierarchical structure of, of, the, of a sound scene, and, and there's multiple ways you could, uh, you could separate. So the first thing we did in that, um, in that direction was to, to build a network uh, that uses the hierarchy of instruments. So if you consider that some instruments are more uh, similar than others, and you want to, um, so you could, and you want to query um, a system, you have a, a, a song, and you want to say, um, give me the part of a song that sounds like this, and you, and you play a guitar uh, sound, for example. Uh, if you play an electric guitar sound, did you mean that you only wanted electric guitars in that song, or did you want all guitars? 
or did you want all in kind of harmonically dominated instruments? It's not clear. Like the intention of the user may not be clear. So we, we built a system that like given a query such as uh, electric guitar, for example, would, uh, would do all of the above. So it will both have an output that only focuses on electric guitars, another that uh, focuses on the parent, which is all guitars, and then another on, on that parent, which is guitars and piano, for example. And we showed that by imposing that kind of architecture, we were able to improve uh, separation performance at the, at the fine grain level um, with, um, to kind of, um, with less ground truth data at that level. So we were able to leverage ground truth data at the parent level, so which arguably may be easier to obtain, um, uh, to, to imp imp uh, improve performance at the finer grain level. Uh, a more recent work, actually, I don't think it's on archive yet. It should be on archive Sunday night. Uh, so uh, it's in the pipeline right now, uh, it's, uh, which is another way to look at um, hierarchical separation. And there's been a lot of, of interest on hyperbolic representations in, uh, in images and in NLU. Um, and hyperbolic spaces are kind of well suited to embed these kind of hierarchical representations. And so we, we thought, like, could, can we do this in audio? Can we use hyperbolic spaces to learn a hierarchical embedding of time frequency bins? And um, so this, we, we tried that on a kind, of a, kind of a toy problem. Like we were just wanting to be very simple. So we built a data set where we had uh, some instruments like bass, guitar, drums, and then uh, male or female speakers. And that our hierarchy in this is going to be bass, guitar, drums, and then music above that, and then male, female, and speech above that. And so basically what we do is just we have, a, um, we project our time, we use a neural network to get us a time frequency embedding, a Euclidean time frequency embedding, like a usual time frequency embedding, that we then uh, project in a hyperbolic space, which is here this, uh, called the Poincaré ball. And basically um, it's, um, so it's a, a non-Euclidean space where uh, the, uh, as the further along the further away from the center you go, the more you can pack. Basically, the distances become, even though they look this, uh, small, they're actually bigger and bigger um, as, you, as you go near the boundary. So you can pack more and more fine-grained things near the boundary. Um, and also, uh, people have, have noticed that um, uh, when you embed um, in these kind of spaces, if the, the system tends to embed um, a, a particular class, uh, a points in a uh, for a particular class near the boundary if it's more certain about that classification uh, accuracy. And when it's, when it's not really sure if it's, uh, if it's a guitar or bass, it's maybe going to backtrack a little bit and, and put the point more towards the center in the music, um, more like in the more general music kind of uh, embedding. Um, and, so we, and so it kind of, uh, kind of does the job. It performs maybe a little bit better than the Euclidean embedding. But what's interesting about this, if this was more like a, a study where you, you can kind of use the, uh, the distance from the center of a ball as a, as a measure of, of certainty. And we, we found that, for example, uh, if you look at, at the number of active sources at, for, uh, at, at particular time frequency bin, those bins that have many active sources tend to be closer to the center, and those that are dominated by a single source tend to be closer to the edge. It's kind of intuitive um, thing. And we also show that um, the, the distance to the center uh, is actually very well correlated with a Bayesian notion of certainty that you can get by running the network uh, many, many times using different realizations of dropout. Um, so if you're interested, you have to wait until Sunday night uh, to see this. Um, all right. Um, now, um, I, so I mentioned earlier that um, we were very motivated by the cocktail party problem. and where the goal is to isolate any source of interest within a complex acoustic scene. And there's been a lot of work on like, you know, separating uh, musical instruments, uh, separating speech from speech. But surprisingly, until last year, there hadn't been a lot of work uh, on separating uh, movie soundtracks or sound, mi like sound mixtures that involve speech, music, and sound effects. And so uh, that's, uh, that's where we came in. And we thought, well, it's kind of a, like a tiny, like, cute version, small version of the cocktail party problem. And so it's kind of like a cocktail fork problem where you have cocktail forks have three prongs. So uh, you separate uh, the soundtrack into music, speech, and, and sound effects. And uh, I'm going to show, um, oh, 
Okay, so, uh, so this, this can have multiple applications. You could apply it as a front end for like video understanding tasks. Like if you can separate these streams, arguably it's going to be easier to do Q and A or, or audio captioning. Uh, you can use it to improve total transcription, like better speech recognition, better event detection, or you can use it to have a better source, uh, um, better listening experience. Like if you're in front of your TV and you want to just listen more to the dialogue without the sound effects blowing at you, you can. Um, you can have this flexible remixing. So we build this interface where um, you can have a cursor, uh, but you can move more towards the speech, the sound effects, or the music. And I'm going to show you a demo. So on the right, you see where, what we focus on. Hi, Phil Swift here for Flex Tape. The super strong waterproof tape. That can instantly pack. No ordinary tape. It's triple thick adhesive virtually welds itself to the water. Major damage. But flex tape grips on tight and bonds instantly. Plus, flex tape's powerful adhesive is so strong. So, so we didn't train on YouTube video. We actually built a data set uh, for this uh, using LibriSpeech, FMA for music, and um, I think audio set, uh, no, FSE 50K for sound effects. We, we did, like, you know, uh, try to make it, mix it as much as possible as, as real soundtracks. So we looked at how sound engineers, producers, um, what levels they use, and we tried to, you know, get some variety within that. And so this data set we call Divide and Remaster, or DNR, um, is actually going to be used in uh, the next sound demixing challenge that was announced yesterday um, as one of the tracks. There's going to be a music track and then a, a cinematic sound uh, separation track. So uh, please participate. There's, a, I think, $10,000 worth of prize for the cinematic track. So, uh, and uh, Mitsubishi Electric is actually sponsoring. Um, all right. Um, so. We can actually, as I mentioned, we can combine this separation with a transcription. So uh, we can you know, do better transcription at the, uh, so for example, sound detection, um, activity detection at the output of a separator. But we can also um, show that classification helps separation. If we uh, get a second separator where we concatenate the activities of each of the three sources, music, sound effects, uh, and, and speech, uh, you, we can get a slight improvement in uh, separation performance. So this, uh, um, this model has uh, information from the activity um, uh, as well. Vice versa, separation helps classification and recognition. We showed that we can get better performance for music and sound effect um, detection. Um, uh, and also for ASR, where we showed that um, uh, you can uh, use the separation to improve um, performance on libre speech. Actually, it, we um, also showed that if you uh, keep a little bit of the other sources, if you remix a little bit the other sources, uh, you can improve slightly performance from uh, 7 dB to uh, 6.2. Uh, sorry, 7% to 6.2 word error rate um, because it kind of avoids some artifacts that the, that the pre-trained model doesn't like. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Um, I think this is the last topic. Do I have five more minutes? Is that OK? OK. Um, so this is the last topic that we work with, uh, on with uh, Ephemius, um, uh, or where we try to, um, again, kind of go at this idea that how you want to slice, how you want to, cut, like, uh, to segment an acoustic scene really depends on, on the user's intention. And there's multiple ways you can ask for something. Um, so the same, the same target source could be described in multiple ways. Uh, for example, if you have some, like a female speaker speaking in French close to the microphone, you could ask for the female speaker, or you could ask for a French-speaking speaker, or the one close to the microphone, and they're all the same, but these are different ways to ask the, the question. Um, uh, and so we wanted to, um, to build a system that could take any of these queries. So like kind of that's why we call it heterogeneous, because these queries are diff different in nature from each other. But still, it's the same network that tames, that you just feed a different conditioning and, and can get the, the, the same target speaker. Um, interestingly, we found that 
by training a system on, um, on these different kind of conditions, we were able to get better separation performance than a system that is trained using uh, permutation invariant training, uh, in which um, then you can you just select the best speaker, the, the actual speaker, in an Oracle way. Um, so we built a data set for this. I believe it's now on GitHub. Um, we, it's, we use a, a conditional version of a sudo RMRF network to do this. Uh, and there are some interesting results. So, um, so this is very difficult to read. I'm sorry that it, we, had, we, we spent a lot of time thinking how to present these results. But uh, basically, this, these numbers show you the percentage of the data uh, that the model is trained on. So when you have 25 everywhere, you have a, a quarter of the data in like with gender like style query or um, uh, spatialized query, so fur close to a microphone or further away. Uh, L is the uh, language, so which language it is. Uh, and, uh, and we had two different data sets, one of them much more reverberant than the other. And we showed that um, if you train on these, um, on these four types of condition of data, using PIT, you can actually do worse than by training actually asking the, the network to, um, to learn these conditions. Uh, and you don't do much further than these are actually four different models in blue. Each time you see 100, that means that we had one model trained on 100% of that data. So each of them is, is, is a specialist model trained only on that particular condition. And um, so we don't go too far from that. And actually, we do better in the language case, because language is so difficult for the network to figure out which language it is that it, it can't really actually learn that well to separate the speakers in the first place. So it's, you're better off learning to separate the speakers better on another condition at the same time as language, because uh, otherwise, basically, the network doesn't learn anything. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we showed that by, um, um, so as I mentioned, like we had a, a data set that was um, a Wall Street Journal that was like anechoic, and then another one that was reverberant. And we wanted to do uh, gender-based separation, so condition on gender, in the reverberant domain. But we did not have any gender labels in the reverberant domain. We, only have, we assume we only have gender information in the anechoic domain. By training, so by tr using the heterogeneous separation, we add another query, which is the energy, which is a very simple uh, condition. It's like you, you make one of the speakers louder than the other, and you ask for the louder speaker, for example, um, which is much the, the easy, probably the easiest condition for, for these kind of networks, and probably what they usually rely on when, they actually, when you let them do what they want to do. Um, and it's very easy to make these kind of, um, these kind of uh, mixtures. You just pick two sources, and you normalize them, make them one louder and you mix them. So you, you can make this kind of, of um, imbalanced mixture very easily in any domain. And we show that by asking the network to either pick the louder or the softer speaker, and sometimes pick the male or female speaker in the anechoic domain where we know who is the male and female, um, and also asking to separate the network to, to get the louder or softer um, speaker in the reverberant domain, it also learns to separate based on gender in the reverberant domain, even though it never saw any gender data in that domain. Um, so it kind of, you're able to do some transfer learning in a way. Um, a follow up to this work, which was also out last month, um, so in, in this heterogeneous condition training, and this, I think this is my last slide, <laughs> um, <coughs> the, um, we kind of have, we have a set of, of various, when we train a network, we have an input mixture, we have a target source in that mixture, which has a set of, of conditions, of queries that you can, that, it, that matches that particular target. So if it's a female French speaker, you could, you could say female, you could say French. Um, so at training time, we just sample that condition, um, kind of with the same probability. We found that, um, um, and we, we thought that maybe there was a way that we could improve this because sometimes the network prefers one of the conditions over another. It, it does be, it, it, even though it's the same target, it does a better job if you ask it for the female speaker than if you ask it for the French speaker, for example, even though it's the same target. Um, so we thought maybe there's a way to, uh, ask, to, to 
train another network to rephrase the query. So if you ask for a French speaker, it would look at the mixture, try to figure out, actually, instead of asking for French, you should ask for female, because that is going to work better. In, um, as a first step along that way, we thought, well, then maybe we should first train a network that tries to do as good as possible um, regardless of the uh, it kind of it, in one of the conditions because we want because we want to rephrase the query to the best one let's first train a, a system that focusing on doing as well as possible on the easiest query on the one that does the best so that's what we did in this optimal condition training uh, instead of uh, sampling any condition we just we um, for a given target we look at all the conditions that match the target uh, look at the performance of the network when it separates based on each of these conditions, and just look at the condition that performs the best, and only backpropagate for that best condition. So we, the network, in a way, always focuses on the easiest case. You would think that would not work, and I would agree with you, uh, but it, it actually, quite surprisingly, it, it does better than the, the normal training. Uh, and then we went further, as I mentioned, we um, introduced another module that takes the mixture and the original condition as input and then um, uh, refines the, the, the query that it gets passed to the condition network. Uh, and um, we looked at this in a, in a slightly different, similar but different task where we had um, some, uh, we could also uh, use a text description of the, of the target uh, as a query. And, and we find that surprisingly, actually, the, this optimal condition training, even though it's trained to perform well on, only on the easiest query, which is not necessarily the text query, uh, it does improve performance on the text query as well. And we also found that this, this refinement also improved a bit performance. All right, this is actually the last slide. <laughs> um, just looking ahead, uh, what we're um, we just you know going further towards this total segmentation analysis um, uh, that we've been shooting for. We've been uh, looking at also integrating uh, localization, separation, uh, and event detection and transcription. Uh, along that direction, one work was um, this uh, uh, class condition, um, sound event detection and localization, which um, um, was based on uh, the, one of the DK's tasks. We've also been uh, we're also looking at, at the audiovisual modeling. We had uh, a paper on um, using visual scene graphs for audio source separation. Uh, we've also started looking at um, audiovisual speaker diarization. This is a bit misleading because that paper um, actually does not use the, uh, it's on an audiovisual speaker diarization data set. We, we get state of the art performance, but without using the video. Uh, so the next step is using the video. Uh, and then we're also interested in, um, as many people are, in using generative modeling, like, such as diffusion models. And we just had a paper last month on uh, using cold diffusion for speech enhancement. And finally, um, we are very much interested in self-supervised and unsupervised learning, but that's not out yet, so you have to wait a little bit more. All right, thank you very much, and um, any questions? So yeah, I think we have time for a few questions, and then unlike usual, instead of stack here, we're gonna walk kind of back to GHC, and we're gonna have like a little social there. Um, I actually did a query, uh, the understand the query condition based yep. approaches. So query here is not text, it's some kind of a grid or something like that. In which case? In, uh, in the original one or the, the, in this one? Yeah. This one? one is, that one is text. So this one, you can, actually, this one also is heterogeneous. You can, you can still query for which source appeared first uh -huh. or second. Uh -huh. um, was it more harmonic or more progressive? Uh -huh. uh, so this is on general sound. It's no longer on speakers. Sure. <coughs> uh, and um, or which one, the signal energy, which one was loudest or softest, or the text description. So uh, which in this case is um, basically a, the, more like an, a tag, but we consider it as, as a sentence. Uh -huh. So it's like dog bark, uh -huh. for example. But we pass it to a bird um, encoder. So all of the above, it can do anything. Uh -huh. it, yeah, the, the, there's a, um, the bird give, gives you a, a conditioner, conditioning, conditional embedding that you pass to the network. And similarly, all the other conditions get 
uh, translated into a, uh, an embedding vector that gets passed to the uh, conditional separation network. Right. Uh, it depends, yeah. Uh, so some of them we're actually only implicitly using masking strategies. Uh, I think the pseudo RMRF is kind of like that. It's it's a learned. It uses learned time frequency representations. Um, so the masking kind of happens in this space that we don't really understand. Um, it is, that is learned. Um, but in uh, in most of the other work, we we've been using um, just short time Fourier transform. And then we apply a mask that can either be uh, a real mask, uh, sometimes but we truncate between 0 and 1. But in other work that I did not present here, we sometimes go further than that because we realize that um, because of uh, phase cancellations between the speech and the noise, sometimes the magnitude of the mixture is actually smaller than that of the speech. Um, so you actually need to boost the magnitude. But doing that is very risky because uh, this kind of situation typically happens when, when in a very noisy situation where the phase is wrong. So if you boost the magnitude but don't do anything about the phase, you can get actually further away from the real speech. So the speech may be there, and, and your, your mixture is here. And, and if you keep in that direction and say, well, but I'm going to try to match that magnitude, you end up here, which is even further. Uh, so you need to pair that with like improving the phase. So this, uh, um, you need to do some of our processing to kind of get a better phase. So, so it can be a real number, or it can be a complex number, um, uh, which tries to correct the phase as well and, and the magnitude at the same time. Or it can also be not a mask. It can be directly, uh, instead of being you know, the, a mask that you apply to the mixture, you can try to just estimate the speech complex, the complex coefficients of the speech directly. Uh, that's the strategy that typically Zhongxiu uses, and that works really well. Right. In the recent years, like, well, yeah. we still estimate it wrong, right? Like, a, a lot of times. I mean, if you use the noisy phase, I mean, very, very quick, you're going to realize that you, you get limited in, in terms of the performance you can get. Um, I mean, actually, using the noisy phase, um, even if you have perfect magnitude, by using the noisy phase, you can actually regenerate the other source. When you, re, when you reconstruct in the, in the waveform domain, the, the phase, um, the fact that the, the information about the other source is present in the phase can actually reconstruct the other source. Um, so, um, I mean, once you reach a certain level, I think phase modeling is very important. Um, that being said, if it, it also depends on your application. If, you, if your application is ASR, for example, it probably doesn't matter that much. Um, because you're not going to use the phase, and in the end, you're going to do a, a feature extractor that, that is based on the magnitude, uh, which is why if you, it's maybe more important to focus on a loss function that involves the magnitude in that case. Um, actually, uh, as, a, as a side note about phase, uh, I had a, a paper uh, maybe in 2009, I think, um, about using, uh, trying to um, uh, to, just to ex illustrate how, how much information you can have in the phase signal. Um, and you can kind of, um, you can play games and modify your magnitude spectrogram uh, of, of a, just an, an isolated sound, like, um, like a, a speech, um, a speech signal, for example. Uh, you can modify that spectrum ever so slightly that um, by, um, by associating with it the right phase, um, you can reconstruct pretty much any signal you want. So you can tweak the phase in a way that all the, um, that phase, that basically what phase does, it, that it takes the magnitude at a time frequency and points it in one, in one direction, right? Um, and then you can kind of use the phase to point all of the, um, all of these um, 
uh, time frequency bins in, in a certain direction such that when you do overlap and add in the inverse short time Fourier transform, they all cancel out perfectly. That's, that's actually very easy to do, right? To have them cancel out is, is trivial. Uh, but you can then cancel out, not quite, but such that they leave just a little bit of signal that once, um, such that at each time frequency bin, they leave a little bit of signal. And when you boost that signal, you just multiply it by a thousand or something, you can get, you can reconstruct like a, a rock music, for example. So you can basically, uh, the only information about the rock music is in the phase that you associate. Um, and in the overlap and add, everything cancels out and just leaves out the rock music, um, which is, I think, super surprising. Uh, but um, so basically, you can play games. I mean, I'm not saying that this is uh, useful or anything, but just to illustrate that there can be a lot of information in the phase that once you do the overlap and add can get un uncovered. Um, and you Hmm. I, I'm not sure I, uh, I, I see the connection. Um, I, I, mean, I have to think about that. I'm not sure I see the connection. Is there but, a specific intuition behind the, the, the sequence? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the sequence was, um, as I mentioned, like do, doing reverberation. Um, you can do much better de reverberation. Yeah, yeah, um, Right. Uh, well, I mean, I think the intuition of, about the first time we did this cascade was that because the speakers are at different locations, you really need the, the dereverberation to be on, on each speaker separately. You cannot apply the same dereverberation filter to, the, to both speakers because they are not in the same location. So, uh, so they need different, they, inherently they need separate filters. Uh, so, so if you, if you uh, apply a dereverberation network to a mixture of speakers, Unless they're in the same location, it's not. I mean, it's going to have to do different treatment for each of them, which sounds very hard. Maybe we'll. Oh, sorry. Are we? Are you good? Please go so far. Yeah. So I have a doubt with regards to uh, how you're determining uh, the number of targets for the identical target to the Okay. Right, right, These right. Are based on our yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so in, in this work, we just imposed a hierarchy. Uh, we had a, an ontology of instruments that was fixed. But yeah, discovering the hierarchy in natural sounds, I mean, that that's, uh, sounds super exciting. Um, never able to figure out like a, like a, a good way to do it. Like also, yeah, this, as you said, like depending on there's so many different hierarchies that you could have, right? right. Um, so which one do you pick and which, I mean, depends on, on the problem. And, uh, but I think, yeah, like trying to discover how the hierarchy is like something that I find very interesting. Yeah. Right. Let's thank Jonathan one more time. Thank you.